getting the most out of every ingredient. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid Blender Collection. Hello and welcome to the British Library 2020 food season, generously sponsored by KitchenAid. My name is Polly Russell and I'm a curator at the British Library and the curator and founder of the food season. And this year I've had the huge pleasure of working with Angela Clutton as the guest director. For the food season, we've wanted, as we have for every year, to make sure that it is really eclectic in what we offer for events, but also that it's relevant. And this year, in the context of COVID, which has so much shone a light on the problems and the challenges in relation to the food system, the food we eat, its relation to the environment, all these things, I can't think of a more important event than this evening's and particularly because of our two speakers who are two of the most incisive, interesting and knowledgeable people in food, Carolyn Steele and Kath Dalmany. Now, Carolyn Steele, I met back in 2006 in the most unlikely way, which was that I was on a tube, I overheard a woman talking about an amazing sounding idea for a book and she was talking to her friend, she said, I don't know if I should do it, I don't know, and I didn't know her from Adam, but it sounded so incredible. Before I got off the tube, I said to her, you have to write that book, it's fantastic. It was Carolyn Steele. She did write that book, which came out in 2008 called Hungry City, which is available to you now. If you want to just look uh, on your screen, there's a tab where you can buy it. Um, Carolyn Steele, who I then uh, came to know as a friend and a colleague, is an architect by trade and training. She draws from history, literature, politics, philosophy, everything to examine our relationship with food and think about how we can fix it. She's the author of two books, Hungry City, which I've just mentioned, and then this year, Cytopia, How Food um, Can Change the World. Both are totally essential reading for anybody interested in food. They are great. I suggest everyone should buy them. The other person tonight is another favorite person of mine, Kath Dalmany. She is the CEO of Sustain, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. She is one of the most lucid, compelling, and powerful speakers on food with years of campaigning and policy work, which is rooted in activism, passion, and a commitment to improve the world. She is quite amazing. I feel so honored to be here and to be able to listen to them both this evening. Um, please do ask questions. There's a form at the bottom of the screen where you can submit your questions and uh, we will be asking those to Kath and Carolyn later on this evening. Uh, but for now, I'm going to hand over to Kath and um, Carolyn for what I know will be a riveting conversation. Thank you so much, Polly. And um, I'm so glad you finally got to tell that story. <laughs> Um, which I will never forget and actually it was, it did, I was at such a balancing point when, when you rushed up to me, this mad woman rushed up to me on the tube train and said, you have to write this book. Um, so you are partly responsible for the fact that I'm here in more ways than one. So thank you for that and also for the wonderful pleasure of being here tonight. And I seem to have started talking, so, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> so no surprises there. I, I um, think we should explain to the audience that Carolyn and I are very good friends and we spend quite a lot of time talking. So uh, we sh please do control us, Polly, if we need to be shut up. <laughs> and Kath and I also had a very interesting original meeting because after Hungry City came out, which was in 2008, I remember, I think it was the very first talk I gave about it was at a meeting of Sustain and um, the slide machine wasn't working. So, so I can't imagine why that could possibly have happened. How could technology possibly ever go wrong? Uh, maybe that's something we'll discuss later. So, so Kath was my kind of my slide changer that day. I think I was actually kneeling at your feet, Carolyn. <laughs> it's a very symbolic and rather wonderful summary of my relationship with your thinking. Uh, kneeling at your feet and listening with absolute joy and uh, excitement, thinking, how on earth am I so lucky to have a job in which I get to be so close to somebody? Oh, 
Anyway, well, I mean, one of the first things I did when I was researching Hungry City was I basically went online. I, actually, I don't even know whether it's online in those days. It's so long ago. But I found out about Sustain and I literally just bought every publication you'd ever produced and read them all. I mean, that was, yeah, that was one of my, I've still got a great pile of, so that was one of my very, very early introductions just to the whole idea of, you know, what food can be and... How did you first ever start thinking about why food is political and philosophical and mm. about mm. human life and happiness? How did you get to the point where you suddenly had that, that moment of seeing through food eyes? I know from experience that answering this question properly can take about 40 minutes, so I'm going to try to give you the... Yes, the, I have tried to chair you sometimes, <laughs> Kevin, absolutely. <laughs> try and give you the three minute version but I mean literally I was studying and then practicing and then teaching as an architect and um there just was this nagging feeling that I had that there was something wrong with the way people discussed architecture and in particular cities and it was all just about the buildings you know it was about the built stuff and traffic flow and density and maybe if you were lucky a bit of public space and I just felt well you know, I was born and bred in London and I loved London and I do love London, but I thought that's not what a city's like at all. You know, there was just something so obviously missing from the architectural discourse. And now I'm going to skip 20 years of struggle because that's how long it took me to realize that maybe food could be the missing link, you know, it, to bring human life, indeed all of life back into the architectural discourse. So that was the, that was the idea behind Hungry City, my first book, the one that Polly actually really, really genuinely did hear me talking about in a very loud voice on the tube train uh, on the way to King's Cross, uh, on her way to the British Library. And, um, and so the idea was simply to try to describe a city through the lens of food. And I'd been interested in food probably for about 20 years before that, I'd read about food. My grandparents had a hotel, so I'd kind of grown up knowing what good food was and also knowing that there was this kind of mysterious space of the green bay's door, you know, with the service door between the kind of the, you know, the glamour and the sort of the pomp and circumstance of a dinner being served and the chaos behind the door, you know, and the kind of grease running down walls and torn liner and people running around frantically and shouting at each other. and even as a small child, I remember thinking there's something really magical about this. The fact that, you know, there's a two and a half inch wide door can separate these two worlds and what it means to have the power to move from one of those spaces to the other space, you know, and to be equally at home in both. So I suppose the idea of space, power, uh, you know, literally structures shaping our lives but also food being something sort of transformational. If I'm really gonna sort of lie on my own metaphorical couch and try to work out where it all came from, you know, it very possibly did come from there. But um, the light bulb moment, as I say, was in the year 2000, after I'd been teaching at the LSE for a year on the city's course and just realizing that, you know, there was this cacophony of voices trying to talk about what a good city could be and everyone was in their silo. And I was just looking for something that would de-siloify the conversation. And I just had this idea of food being that. And I, I'll never forget it because I got sort of goose, you know, goose pimples all over my body and my hair stood up on end. I mean, I just knew that was my subject. And it, it, that was the moment that changed my life. And that's 20 years ago now. So um, it's what I've oh, been doing I ever since. I love those goose pimple moments. They're just, it's really yeah. important. It's but yeah. someone finally gets it and I, the light goes on and you think, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I might actually, just since we know each other well, throw the same question back at you. <laughs> what was your <laughs> what was your goose I, pimple moment? I think I think people once once you see we've we've had a conversation, haven't we, before about seeing through the, the glasses, the lens. Yeah. Of yeah. I think I've had various moments where <clears throat> suddenly the light's gone on. And I'm, one of them was when I was about 16 and I was working in catering for Debenhams uh, mm. in the staff canteen. And I stood on a piece of fish. There was a piece of white fish on the floor and I left an enormous great footprint in it. And then when I said, what, what, what should I, I do with this? I'm terribly sorry, I've stood on a piece of fish. They went, oh, I'll just put it back in the pan. 
and I kind of took a great interest in food safety and <laughs> but mm. you know, kind of st 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 sort of stayed with me that funny little event because it, it became an anecdote but it's one of those things where you're like how did we get to the lack of respect for the thing because mm. I yeah, served yeah. That piece of fish later as a 16 year old somebody who the footprint was still there in the batter yeah. And I, it, it haunts me still that some poor person ate a piece of fish with my footprint in it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but on a more serious note, also, I, I saw a documentary, probably about a similar age, mm. the BBC documentary, and it was all about chicken production. So this was yeah. way before Fast Food Nation and Eric Schlosser. Yeah. And I remember watching it on the little portable television in my bedroom because my parents were watching something else downstairs and it was all about awful chicken production yeah i remember it was so well made because it was also about how awful the jobs were and how yeah 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 <clears throat> the life yeah. that implied yeah. and the yeah. income of the people working in it and it all felt so unfair mm -hmm. and, you know, a fundamental value within the food system is fairness yeah and, and it's not being lived out at the moment and yet when you do do it well it's blooming marvelous and i you know, know I know. Yeah, and that's so interesting you know, because sustainability, you can do friendships, you can do health, and you can have enjoyable, wonderful relationships. Yeah. As you know, and you've introduced me to these concepts at a more intellectual level than standing on fish in a Debenhams campaign. <laughs> uh, but it just, why don't we do it better? Because we yeah. are. I mean, I think it seriously. It's very, very interesting tracing why we don't. And obviously, that's something that I have done a lot in my work. And I mean, your chicken story or watching the chicken documentary is so interesting because, I mean, I began Hungry City with, I mean, I was yeah, right at the start of researching Hungry City. So back in 2000, I was obviously taping and watching literally every film that came up about food in any respect. And there was already quite a lot then. And I remember it's just before Christmas and there were two documentaries that came up simultaneously. And one was... Rick Stein and you know with Chalky kind of going around these beautiful landscapes you know with Elgar playing in the background sort of going isn't it marvellous you know sort of <laughs> and reared turkeys that have been massaged with love <laughs> and, you know, and you can imagine the whole thing yep. anyway at the same time on Channel 4 there was one of those shock horror expose type documentaries about you know what I call animal gulags in other words as you say sort of birds literally being sort of you know unable to walk and sort of lame and oh, that horror interestingly as a as a normal person you wouldn't have been able to watch those two documentaries at the same time you had to have been so obsessive that you had to take one watch the other one because they were you know and then watch the other one later because they were broadcast at the same time and i i began hungry city by saying you know how as a sort of normal inhabitant a normal citizen just a well-meaning person living in the UK, are you meant to make sense of this? Yeah, you know, of course, you, you know, you want it all to be lovely. You want to eat happy birds and lovely landscapes. But but the reality is, I mean, I did the maths. I did, you know, the turkey maths, as it were. If you all ate turkeys raised the way that Rick Stein's kind of lovingly massage and hand killed turkeys were raised, as it were, literally, that would take the whole of the the whole of the UK. I mean, <laughs> that would be all we would be able to grow. So, so the dilemmas, the paradoxes, you know, I mean, they became very, very vis visible to me very early on. And I think, you know, in, in part answer to one of the questions that you suggested just now, I mean, one of the things is that we actually don't really want to think about the reality of what food is, you know. Um, I mean, we've created this thing called cheap food, which, you know, you and I and many people listening, you know, does not exist you know, by externalizing its true costs. And um, deep down, we know it's wrong. I mean, of course, COVID is one of the externalities of this bizarre system that we've created. Um, you know, I mean, we're, we're destroying the planet in the name of cheap food, actually. And, you know, to me, it's really interesting that sort of there's a, there's a kind of cognitive dissonance going on in our heads where we're sort of, you know, we, we want to eat well. I mean, again, like you, my metaphor for good society is one in which everybody eats well. I mean, I, I can't think of a better way of describing a good society. But to do that, to create the conditions in which that would occur would literally require a revolution. 
which I am arguing for. I mean, that's what Zootopia is, which I might come on and explain in a minute. But I've... And there's no wonder that people find it difficult to, to know how to achieve that for themselves when the whole construct around us doesn't, isn't about that. It's about a, a dissonant relationship with food at the moment. Yeah. I remember asking a very dear friend of mine who called Mo, Mo Burns up in um, Herefordshire. She was working with um, lovely women from low income families to help them with cooking skills. And she would often ask them, what's the one thing you want to be able to make? And it was gravy. And she couldn't understand at first why gravy was so important. And, it, and between us, we worked out it was the moment of pouring it and all that that implied. It mm. meant that there were people around your table. It meant, mm. that, the table. It mm. meant that your family could gather. Mm. It meant that you had you'd got a piece of meat on the table and could afford it. Yeah. It meant that you had time on a Sunday to be together and that you yeah. were not fighting. Yeah. It meant that people wanted to be together and that there was family and that there was somebody in charge of a warm, a convivial yes. space in which people could be together. And we got quite tearful talking about that moment of the gravy. It wasn't a bisto moment, it was a, <laughs> a sorry. A joint yeah. <laughs> It yeah. allowed into a whole culture of having an enjoyable moment of family exactly. and food. And and just but so people stand on the edge of that, desiring it and not necessarily being able to because they can't but, afford it. Or because but but the Bisto it. moment is so interesting, isn't it? Because Bisto, I mean, if you like what, to that idea, everything you're talking about, which I absolutely agree, you know, the happiest times in my life are the times when I have people I love gathered around and I've cooked for them and we're sharing food. There's just, there just is nothing. This is how we evolved as a species. This is what home is to us. This is what belonging is to us. I often say that the shared meal is the first and best economy ever invented, which is another conversation we might get into if we're given a series by the British Library. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, maybe not tonight. But, um, but the Bisto thing is so interesting, isn't it? Because the Bisto thing is actually a corporation saying, well, you know you, you want this, but actually you don't have time to actually do this because you're far too busy doing whatever we're far too busy doing. Therefore, let's pretend, you know, you yeah, can absolutely. put brown we'll take, we'll powder take and, and yeah. make that the thing that matters rather than all of the other things that it implies. Exactly. It literally picks the wrong bit. Because one of the things I loved in your original Hungry City book was the it was and also in your subsequent talks, some of which I chaired and just sat there again going, oh, I love this book, <laughs> uh, was this the idea of the implication of the type of food we buy implies the type of shopping and in ty um, implies the kind of relationship we have with transport and with mm. each other. Mm -hmm. so if we are buying from large out of town boxes, then we're going to spend our Saturdays in a car going to, to visit them. Yeah. And that that is all generated by town planning so that our choices aren't really our choices. Because often no, no, they're not. the impression that this plethora of choice in the supermarkets is, is a wonderful thing that's come down to us and it's actually governed by our choices when actually no. we, we are choosing from something that's being presented to us and that is our culture. But the culture is defined by others, including the Coca-Colas of this world and the Heinz baked beans of this world. No, you know, nothing wrong with be baked beans, mm. wrong with sugary water. But mm. just, but these things are defined, and then then our disease patterns, our family yeah. relationships, yeah, our, yeah, 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 yeah. our relationship with farming, our, the ability of the farmer to make a living is then controlled as well. And, yeah. and also these things make food so profoundly political. But then that's a lot to take on if you're not as obsessed as me. You know, nobody well, will go with me anymore, Carolyn, because it takes so long because I keep reading all the labels. It's just... <laughs> yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think the, you know, in a way, I mean, one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about tonight was the fact that, you know, it fascinates me that we both want the same things. We're arguing for the same things. We're trying to, we are both trying to change the world and to revalue food and to make, make it clear to people why there can be no such thing as cheap food and why revaluing food is the heart of literally facing all of the issues that we sort of, you know, are confronting around the world. They're all linked to this and that by revaluing food, everything can be made better. It ri literally sits at the heart of everything. And yet I've come to it from an architectural perspective, if you like, which has become also, as you say, a philosophical and now political and economic and sort of really multifaceted perspective. And, and, but I write books, you know, I try to change people's minds by talking about this stuff and by trying to understand how we got here. Whereas you, 
are on what I call the front line. You know, you're, you're actually actively meeting people. You're saying, no, it's not good enough. You know, you, if we're going to have an Olympics, we're going to have sustainable fish, you know, and you're actually meeting the, the, the corporations who are actually making these enormous decisions. So that in itself fascinates me, you know, and I think yeah. one of the things that I would say is that that is another extraordinary facet of food. I mean, the reason why food is so powerful as a medium for changing the world is that we all eat. You know, you, you can't opt out of food. <laughs> and, and, and it's absolutely multifaceted. So if you meet someone who gets food, like you and I met, yeah, you know, it. It's instant. Food. It's like you've known them all your life. Uh, I adore people who get it. I, I just immediately, it's one. Yeah, you can yeah. tell it's like the lights on. I mean, it's but just... I don't think I am frontline. I think the people who are frontline are the ones who run food banks and the people who are frontline are the ones who, make, who are chefs. And the people yeah. Are yeah. Yeah. And the people who actually get their hands dirty with this stuff. And yeah. then that's what I tend to do, I'm a connector between <clears throat> the world of policy and the world of practice. Yeah. And, and the policies and the fiscal stuff that would make practice much better and, and it yeah. would, for it to be easier to be a farmer or be yeah. a chef. Yeah. But, but then I just see the disconnect between the two as well. So that, you know, the people who are in high power, I'm here to tell you now, don't mm -hmm. really get it. As mm. I said, the thing I really value in uh, you know, all interactions with human beings is if they get the idea that food uh, matters and the environment matters and sociability matters and mm. fairness matters. Mm. 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 And I, I'm, I'm getting dismayed. And I mean, the whole experience of COVID has been is that we don't get it as a culture. And mm. I'm not, I'm not well, am I not blaming anybody? Mm, I did sue a few people during COVID. So perhaps yes, I that sounded interesting. How, how did that go? Uh, well, Marcus Rashford actually won in the end. That's <laughs> him. Bless him and his Nike socks. No, I know. I'm amazing. Uh, yeah, because we were basically saying to government, you can't let children go hungry during a national emergency. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's in the campaign statement. There's no alternative mm. motive there, is there? You cannot let children go hungry ever, but mm. especially in a national emergency. But of course, uh, that wasn't getting through. So we were all throwing everything at it. There were campaign mm. groups, there were policy people. Marcus Rashford came in with his wonderful authenticity and just absolutely. Yeah forward expert by experience but we were litigating behind the scenes with Jolie and Mormon the good law project and it just yeah. felt like the time had come sometimes you, you you can't play nice anymore you just have to go that's no. right and I, I mean I, I absolutely take your point about you're not on the front line you know neither of us are sort of getting up at five in the morning to pull you know potatoes out of the ground for you know less than a living wage but I would also say that anyone who understands the true value of food and actually devotes themselves to trying to kind of revalue food in the culture is on their own front line, whatever it is, you know, it is a sort of yeah, every, parent, every, every, every interaction with food. And what, let's make all of that easier because it's so yeah. fundamental to who we are. It's yeah. our interaction with the planet. Yeah. It's yeah. The main thing that if we got right, life would be better for everybody, you know, like longer, happier lives, sense of all dignity, of it. mental, all of, it. all of that. And I, I can't help thinking, I'm sorry, I, you know, I'm sure that half the audience is male, but I can't help thinking that it's also classed as a female issue, you know, when actually it's far more fundamental and, and, uh, mm. and more than that. But as you've always said, because it goes invisible and because mm. it's a domestic kind mm. of domestic subject, mm. unless it becomes a logistical supply chain thing, in which case it turns back into infrastructure and tech and vehicles. I don't, I don't yeah. mean to anybody with that, but it just feels like it's diminished as a subject a lot uh, when actually it's it's who we are. It certainly was. I mean, certainly when I started writing Hungry City, I would say it was it was largely invisible to most people, you know. And I mean, in fact, 2000, interestingly, was the year that there was a very key document written by a couple of American academics called Why Food is a Planning Issue or something, you know, because basically for sort of 150 years, People's yeah. dining city is just completely forgotten uh, about food. Yeah. So, you know, which is, it is astonishing. I mean, I, I am going to just try to explain this word I've invented because it is really key to my thinking now. And it is, the word Cytopia, as Polly said in her introduction, and it just comes from the Greek word Cytos for food and Topos for Okay, you've got more than I've got. So where do we go from here? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for that.
That's I don't excellent. think I don't think the audience can see it, but I'm holding up two copies of. Okay. okay. Well, the, the the reason I invented this word, thank you, darling. I think you can put those down now. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> the reason the reason I invented this word was that uh, you know at the end of researching Hungry City, I'd come to realise how profoundly food shapes our lives. You know, and it's not just our waistlines and our health and our mind, it's, you know, our homes, our habits, our economies, our politics, our cities, our landscapes, our climate, as we're now seeing, you know, it's everything. And I often say it's too big to see, you know, because it's, it's, it's just, it's everywhere and we wouldn't be here without it. So, um, you know, I was actually researching utopia at the time because I was being an architect. And, it, and interestingly, another thing I would say about food is that, um, you know, the, it, it, can, it connects everything. And therefore, if you, if you understand it, it doesn't matter what you do as a day job, you know, it, it, it literally makes the difference between doing something right and doing it wrong. You know, it's absolutely fundamental to a good life. It, indeed, it is life because of course it consists of food is living things that we nurture and then kill so we can live. So that just, I often like to say that just to remind people that this couldn't possibly be cheap or if it is cheap, we're cheapening life. Anyway, so I was researching Utopia because as an architect, I was looking for a sort of multidisciplinary way of, of thinking about how we should, could live better basically. And I remember reading in the introduction to my copy of Thomas More's Utopia that the, the U in Utopia can either mean a good place from the Greek E-U, which means good, or no place from the Greek O-U, no. In other words, it's an ideal place that can't exist. And I remember finding this really depressing. But, and that was when I had the idea, I thought, well, we live in a world shaped by food already, we just live in a bad one because we don't value the stuff from which it's made, i.e. food. So maybe Sitopia could be a kind of, you know, a real life practical alternative to Utopia about thinking in a complex, connected, systemic, multidimensional way about how to live better. And, and that's what I believe it is, you know, and that is why I'm so passionate about it because I, you know, I literally have been at this for 20 years now and I haven't found a single thing that you can't address through food. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's sort of miraculous stuff in a sense. And, you know, so, and, and to me, that's what you do at Sustain as well. I mean, in fact, I should ask you a little bit more because people might not know. I mean, I know, I know the amazing work you do, but I mean, just, just what Sustain is and to me, you're building a better Zootopia. That's what you're actually doing in my terminology. But you know, oh, yeah. what is it from day to day? I mean, what does a day in the life of a CEO of Sustain look like? That's a really <laughs> good question. I'd love to know the answer. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's my, it is my immense privilege to work with Sustain, but it's also quite bonkers uh, because it's about bringing together hundreds of people and organizations to try and fix stuff together but I work with gloriously great colleagues who I wish they knew how wonderful they were I keep saying it but they go oh Catherine says that all the time but just people <laughs> who get it and therefore are trying to what do we do we run campaigns we run policy projects we bring together people who care about particular issues like sustainable farming or children's food or food poverty as in people not being able to afford the means of a good life um, we get we come together around community food growing in community gardens um, and we talk to local places, local authorities and to government ministers. Sometimes we shout at them. Sometimes we work very kindly with them. Uh, anything that works to try and make the food system better. But always, I think, trying to find the gatekeepers to that, to say, mm -hmm. which can mm -hmm. be a gatekeeper in a school kitchen. I, I mean, somebody who is actually preparing the food and helping yeah they work well by getting them the right budget and you know the right standards that will then be applied so that people aren't always whittling the mm. quality of the food away mm. uh, but also at the moment very much involved with all the legislation that's going to be sorry to mention it i'm going to say the b word yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know talking about all the legislation that that actually, in, our, any, yeah, yeah. in our country for the next decades yeah. and, and so trade policy agriculture policy what replaces the cap common agricultural policy yeah 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 policy. are we going to fish 
the seas dry for our fish protein or are we going to look after the marine ecosystems yeah yeah really it is ours and we're not making good choices right at the moment and that just i mean that has to get me out of bed every morning because we can't do this I, I i have deliberately sorry i don't know how where to point on zoom i keep on i bring, always bring something from my i can't point in the right direction carolyn this, <laughs> my daughter's monkey, and i always have some memento of my beautiful six-year-old daughter in the room whenever i'm on zoom because it's it or to the wonderful audience of the british library because it always reminds me that it's about her future yeah um, yeah 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 absolutely we must i mean i think it's so interesting in the uk because again in my work i've gone in great detail into kind of the reasons why we have such a screwed up food system here, you know, and it's really, really interesting tracing some of the reasons, you know, for example, the industrial revolution, you know, where does food come from? The countryside, what did we do in the 18th century? Moved all the peasants off the land and into factories, you know, yeah, so exactly. we severed our relationship with, with, you know, the place where food comes from. And then, you know, again, very interestingly, you know, it, it, French Revolution, um, basically the diaspora of French chefs that was global, um, came to the UK and we really adopted French cuisine as the sort of, as haute cuisine, you know, the top of our, you know, the, the highest the, the, the food culture could be. So if you like, if you, if you think of a healthy culture as something that's vertical, that comes from the soil, you know, and comes from the land, and has an aspiration to be courtly and wonderful, and everyone else is kind of somewhere in between that. We cut ourselves off at the knees, and then we chopped ourselves off at the head. So we just had this weird little band left. And last but not least, the special relationship with America. So, for example, in the 20th century, when so it's, I mean, again, like I say, so 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 much to talk about in so little time, but I mean. You know, it fascinates me that when supermarkets came to Europe, Britain was the only nation in Europe that did not put legislation in limiting, you know, how big and where supermarkets could be built because we simply didn't see or didn't want to see, you know, mm. the effect that they could have on city centres, for example. So, you know, and it's no accident at all that we, you know, Britain eats more ready meals than the rest of Europe put together. You know, we, we spend less time eating than anywhere else in Europe. Uh, we spend less time cooking. I mean, COVID's been a very interesting sort of mirror onto some of this, because of course, some of this has been shifting in certain very limited sectors, of course, it has to be said. But I mean, I think, you know, and also this idea of, you know, being a sort of br <laughs> brave trading nation and the, the idea that we can always just go off and get our food from somewhere else which actually, I mean, to my utter astonishment and horror, you know, led a Tory MP a few weeks ago, I'm sure you remember sort of saying, well, we don't need farmers in the UK because we can just, you know, go out and buy this stuff. I mean, <laughs> astonishing mentality, but there are very, very clear reasons for where it's all come from. Um, and, you know, that's where we are. I mean, in Brexit, I mean, no, absolutely nobody's given any thought to this at all. It's just... <laughs> sort of desperately buying up kind of car parks in Kent. Uh, it feels like our great leaders treat food as if it was television sets or washing machines or something. You know, this is our fundamental relationship with all of the land in the UK, well, 75% of the UK land mass. Mm. It's our fundamental relationship with whether we are, have a secure food. I'm not, I'm not a massive food security advocate because mm. we do import and we will trade and that's fabulous. Yeah, of course, yeah. But it's, you know, the idea that you wouldn't know where your food's coming from as a whole nation, let alone as individual households. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Just insane. I mean, it's this idea, I mean, again, going a little bit philosophical, for me, this also comes from this, you know, the ancient peasant dream of not having to work to feed yourself, you know, the land of cocaine, where you just kind of lie around and, you know, houses are made of gingerbread and rivers flow with wine and pigs run around with knives in their back, sort of basically said, just saying cut a slice and eat me, you know I mean? And, no, seriously, oh, this is quite yeah, wacky that, it? <laughs> <laughs> You know, the very famous Bruegel uh, representation yeah, yeah, yeah. of this. But, um, you know, so it's always been, since hunter-gatherer societies, interestingly, when it was very different, but ever since then, it's been high status to not have to think about where your food mm. comes from. And of course, one of the false promises of industrial food is that, oh, we can all be like kings now. You know, we can all eat whatever we want, whenever we want, and nobody has to think about it. 
you know, so there's a really interesting kind of a status thing kind of sneaking in there as well, which again may be very subconscious. And also it is rather good that we're all de-skilled in cooking and using food from fresh because actually it's more profitable for there to be yeah. buying meal kits, you know, the, where everything's been decided for you, for you not to really engage with these things to have ready meals and then be able to be available for more of low paid work, which is not a life that, you know, we should be aspiring to. No, it's no. In our power to make life better for people and for there to be more leisure for more people yes. well, so that you can actually enjoy conviviality, enjoy a better life, have better mental health, enjoy green space, all these things. We have it in our power. We invented the we economy. We have it in our power. And I mean, I'm you've brought up- revolutionary with age, I really am, Carolyn. You know, I'm just, I, I feel like I've, I started singing it I was doing my teeth this morning I started humming in 1649 to St George's Hill a ragged band they call yeah. it yeah. 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 On a yeah. but there an element of why are we not just saying the land is about our futures exactly it comes back to some fundamental things about you know sorry to use an old-fashioned phrase but the means of production no, it, it really does about our relationship with premises with land with the ability to move stuff around the fairness the trading schemes yeah yeah, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm on the board of um of of, uh, fruit and veg trading scheme in North London in Hackney yeah. and communities. I am so proud of them because they make fruit and vegetables possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do it with living wages. They pay the farmers profit. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know yeah. What? They did really well during COVID because the farmers were actually being paid properly and you yes. know, the whole thing worked partly because they had mixed farming as well. So there is yeah. a year for the people. There's yeah working on the farms and they're paid properly as well it's completely it's possible life links to food it, production. i mean it, it's yeah. totally doable as you say i mean i and, and you've raised something really important which i think you know needs to be restated which is that you know the big question that nobody is asking at the moment and particularly not people in power is what is a good life yeah absolutely you know, and we have this kind of weird inherited you know, you could say 200 year old idea of what a good life is that comes partly from industrialization and partly from empire and partly from, I don't know what it comes from, but you know, the idea that basically it's running around like a mad hamster on a wheel to get rich. So you can buy handbags as far as I can make. <laughs> well, do you, know I just, you know, this is not my idea of a good life, you know, no. this sort of somehow we're just not asking a question and what you yeah, and at the moment I mean, the, the good life that's being presented again by our dear leaders is yeah. that we get cheap uh, timtams from australia yeah. all, all so the lovely. things that we know are impossible yeah. like infinite growth and, and and so on and you're absolutely right it comes back to land i mean i think this is fundamental and i mean actually when i was researching Zootopia, i got really interested in in henry george who was the american economist who basically came up with the idea of the land value tax you know I mean if you oh, read yeah, yeah, yeah. many utopians I mean well I mean if you go back to Adam Smith of course you know one of the most interesting things is that you know he says well all wealth comes from the land obviously um but but luckily it comes for free you know this idea that nature comes for free you know so if you like you've got this kind of two and a half century old system based on a totally false assumption you and know. that you can keep on extracting forever yeah, without having any exactly refinement. yeah so 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 it's very so henry george is super interesting and, and you know the, the basic premise is that uh, and it actually comes out of anarchism to an extent as well which is also super interesting but the idea that you know nobody has the right to own land forever you know yes you can sort of farm farm it and live on it and build houses on it but you need to pay a rent to the community who really owns the land, you know. So it's actually something that Ebenezer Howard got really interested in when he was kind of coming up with his garden city concept was, you know, essentially a radical proposal of incremental land reform. Um, and it's very, very clear to me. I mean, this isn't coming from me, you know, it's coming from Thomas Piketty, it's coming from Kate Rayworth, it's coming from Joseph mm -hmm. Stiglitz. I mean, a whole kind of bunch of economists kind of going, hey guys, you know, there's something wrong with the maths. And we, we actually need wealth redistribution. And I mean, to come back to my thing about what is a good life, you know, we've seen it under COVID, I think. We've seen that if people have a nice home, ideally with a garden, but not necessarily, or some shared outside space, but just enough space to thrive, 
and enough money to sort of grow food, feed themselves, do something productive, you know, make stuff. I mean, I think the whole rediscovery of cookery, and again, I know it's only in a small slot of society and there's been horror stories going the other way as well. But, you know, this idea that people are going, oh, you know, it's actually quite nice taking three hours to cook, going back to your gravy thing, you know, taking three hours to cook for my family and cooking with my kids and actually... Well, you can only do that if you're having proper living wages, you know, and... Exactly. I had a bit of a shock at the weekend because yeah. I was down to the Museum of London because she's doing the Great Fire of London at school, so we popped down to go and see some of the artefacts. And there was a poster in the um, Suffragette exhibition which was about women asking for a living wage. And it said, yeah. one day we'll get the living wage. And of course, yeah. it was 1911. Yeah. And I was thinking, good grief. You know, we're still know. to argue about people being able to just pay the Still them struggling them with this stuff. Raising a family. Yeah. Still arguing about that now. And yeah. it, I mean, that's only a hundred years or so, isn't it? And it's just, it's just really, it, make, it makes me feel like, what do we have to do to make things fair what do we have to do to make things sustainable and it, it makes me really feel galvanized that we've got to step up action on it i think there's never going to be a better time than now and now is now is the moment you know, now is the moment and and you know going back to this metaphor of a shared meal being you know a shared meal being the best metaphor for a good society because if everybody eats well that means they're living well you know, it means they can afford to eat good food, yeah, absolutely. which is food that's being produced without despoiling landscapes, without slavery, without cruelty to animals and all the rest of it. And you without know. the extractive relationship with... Exactly, regeneratively. ...who are producing our, you know, high value treats and, you know, you know actually returning cash to the communities who grow the stuff in yeah. order to live a good life themselves. I mean, it just feels... It feels like we've got to get this right, you know, and as you've always said, food is so fundamental to that. Yeah, but I think what, what we, it, this is not about food, ironically, it's <laughs> about life. Yeah, of course. Seen through the lens of food. So, so the really big question that we have to ask, use food in order to ask now, is what is a good life? And a good life is one where, you know, I mean, it's basic, basic stuff. It's where you have as you say, the wherewithal to support yourself, you have a supportive community, you have safety, you can afford to eat well, you have something meaningful to do that gets you up in the morning. So by the time you go to bed, you know, you can feel good about yourself. And, you know, that, that allows you to grow, not in a kind of yeah, accumulative way, as in, oh my God, I must have another handbag. But, but sorry, I don't know why I've got a fixation about handbags, but um, <laughs> you know, growing skill. You know, grow in knowledge, grow I know, in, and it's been know. one of the wonderful things over the last 10 years or so. We've been running things like the Real Bread campaign. My dear friend, Andrew Whitley, who wrote the yeah, yeah. Bread Matters. Mm. Uh, wonderful, wonderful man. And he came around for breakfast at my house once and just started talking bread. And we've, we've been running this Real Bread campaign. Uh, this isn't just a promo. This is also about the idea that people want to make bread and want to make a living out of it. Mm. And that was yeah. somehow a bit uh, considered a bit weird at the time. Yeah. Like, Going back in time to yeah. a Charlie Wood white sliced loaf. Oh, this drives like, me nuts. Oh, actually, making yeah. a living bread and a decent living and a craftsman. Yeah. We're craftspeople as well. Look at these hands. Yeah, well, this and is how we evolved our intelligence. Well, so, I often, you, know, you, often when I'm, you, you know, sometimes I do have a ready meal or, or a thing that I'm opening. At yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we all have yeah. complicated lives. But when I do that, I think I'm sort of slightly betraying all the effort that millions of people before me put into creating these hands. Yes. All the yeah. effort that went into making these things that can make we, food. We became that. intelligent through the use of our hands. Absolutely. And I mean, if I want to meditate or something, I chop up an onion. And that's literally what I do. And, you yeah. know, cooking is the low-hanging fruit, haha. But I mean, you know, I mean, I really believe strongly that humans need to create. They need to make stuff. And, you know, since we have to eat every day, you know, the idea that we've evolved this kind of concept that we're too busy to cook, you know, and we've evolved an economy that actually makes it the case that many people are too busy or exhausted to cook. And that's the, the C word that, you know, we can come back to, no doubt, many more times. But, you know, as I said, weirdly under, under lockdown, people have rediscovered that actually getting off the hamster wheel and just kind of making bread and growing stuff is a very, very big part of a good life. And it's just doesn't even show up on the economic radar. 
Um, yeah, it was one of the things I'm most proud of with working at Sustain. So it's not, I'm not claiming credit for this because mm. I probably did it, but it's to get, um, we run a thing called Capital Growth, which is a big scheme to get mm, mm, mm. spaces across the city. Just yeah. These pockets of land that people were not, you know, not able to get access to. So if you live on a housing estate, You'd be looking down at a nice green space with a with a fence around it and you weren't allowed in it and there was no water at the point and all this kind of stuff once you get coordinated into a campaign yeah. you say yeah. to the housing association this is a respectable scheme why yeah. don't we let more people down into this grass and yeah. you know, allow it to be dug up to grow some potatoes oh and have a party and occasionally when there's a shed and we can actually store some things in there and oh some educational activities can happen oh people are talking to each it's other it's transformative yeah. and it absolutely it makes me just so happy when I yeah. see places thriving. I cycle past when when we're allowed to go into work. Not at the moment, obviously, but I cycle past about twelve of them, and it makes me just yeah a bit of joy. And every every single time I see an allotment site or a community garden, I, I think I mean it's interesting. Themselves, this yeah. stuff, and also something I call um, you know a landscape for human flourishing. And obviously, human includes non-human because there is no That's human flourishing true. without non-human flourishing. But I believe a big part of it is bringing, and I often talk about Aristotle's term, political animals, you know, and this kind of dualism that we have, that we're political, which means we need sociability, which is why we build cities, but we're also animals, which means we need nature. And how do you bring society and nature together? And I mean, in a way, that's my architectural project now is how do you do that? Because as you rightly say, it can happen at any scale. It can be community gardens in a housing estate. It could be me growing herbs on my, you know, windowsill or on my roof on my way up to my flat. And profoundly, it, it has to be about the relationship between the city and its productive hinterland, wherever that is. You know, and again, I mean, we haven't got time to go into the complexities of what that means, but, you know, I, I think, Re reconnecting the city and the country and bringing society and nature together are their key design ideas really that are fundamental. Yeah, absolutely. To the, I'm, now I'm yeah. really fascinated by the mechanics of that. How do we make the land available? How do we make the supply chains that support horticulturalists who are in peri-urban areas? And I, you know, there are fantastic pioneers of that who are yeah. making work. And yeah. The, charitable way in a in an enterprise way that can really make good jobs as well. Yeah. And I, if, uh, that is what we're going to spend the next decade doing is making yeah. that to make uh, the sustainable food supply system actually work and it might be despite policy and despite the money and maybe it will involve some revolutionary acts of just getting onto land and starting to use it because yeah. it's, it's got to change it's got it, land, land reform is critical I, none of this can happen without land reform and, and waking up the owners of that land to being part of the solution and it can yeah. be really good fun as well I think it's like everybody <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's how I, I really think a lot of this stuff is also about how you present it. So, you know, I think a lot of the the problems around the way people sort of discuss climate change and ecological destruction and so on is it's all about stuff we can't do anymore. Yes, you yes, know. Yes. But but this is why I'm so obsessed with this idea of coming up with this new vision of a good life that is so wonderful that you want it, you know, if you like to be. You, you know, if you, if you want, you, exactly, you're so busy bake, baking sourdough loaf to make it a little bit kind of cartoonish, you know, that you forget that you you didn't get that that Louis Vuitton handbag. I mean, you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because no, it's just so much more handbag at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing parallel. Can I, I'm so sorry. I am, I am jumping in. I do not want to stop you for one moment because I could just, I'm sure everyone here could listen to you for hours. It is fascinating. But I think at the point at which we are baking a sourdough loaf, not buying a Louis Vuitton handbag, <laughs> is a moment what? <laughs> to, it's a really good moment because we've got had so many fantastic questions, which are all related to the things mm. we've been talking about. And I'd love to just throw them out to, Please, to you. Absolutely. absolutely. But I'm going to um, start with one from uh, Judith, who... Uh, who sent it in right at the beginning and she said what city or cities have the best possible relationship with the surrounding countryside mm, mm. what are the examples of kind of best practice mm, mm. 
in the I world. I don't think I've seen anywhere that's doing it perfectly, but I could name you immediately a hundred wonderful initiatives all over the country. Take a look at sustainable food places, formerly sustainable food cities, where there are people keeping this stuff alive and they are creating sustainable supply chains, you know, fair food initiatives, really creative, uh, saving food from going to waste, making it happen, you know, really yeah. doing it. And there's these lovely um, partnerships uh, join with where people are joining together to make it happen. And just, yeah. it's very creative and of each individual place. So each one has a characteristic. And when we're allowed out, it's my favorite event of the year to go to their conference. And I get to stand up in front of friends and I feel like it, it's like going to a glorious wedding every year because it's all your favorite people in the same place. Uh, and what about, I, Kath or Carolyn, what about more kind of globally, like in the in the planet? Is there a kind of city that's doing it well outside of the UK? Yeah, I mean, I think what, what I would add to what Kath's saying, and this is this is the profound irony as far as I'm concerned, is that if you go to so many places in the world where they haven't basically done the whole industrial shtick yet, you often have a really, in my view, quasi-ideal relationship between the city and the countryside. So you know, for example, I was in Nairobi recently and, you know, I mean, in fact, it's just about to close down, but they've still got their main central market, you know, and this place is absolutely heaving with people and with local produce and with people coming and loading up their wagons with kind of amazing, you know, piles of onions and melons and goodness knows what else, and then trundling it by hand out into the city to be sold. Now, you know, on one level, you can say, OK, that's a bit, you know, that's a bit kind of antiquated and so on. And there are clearly issues with it. But the model itself, because it's 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 in it's small scale, it's intricate. It's actually related to ordinary people's lives and you can make a living doing it, you know. So it's almost the, the stuff that we've lost that the kinds of places Kath's describing are trying to bring back after 200 years of going, oh, we'll just import it all from Brazil or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So th those are the two big sources of inspiration for me are- the Markets are a sure sign things, something's going right, aren't they? And also the there's a lovely network called the Better Food Traders Network, which is linked in with the Growing Community Scheme that I mentioned earlier. Growing Community Scheme sounds like a small thing. It's a million pound turnover fruit and veg scheme linked with fair trading. So it's not no, no small beer, but- uh, although we do enjoy a beer occasionally. Uh, the, but I think the Better Food Traders Network is also about that kind of mutuality and the support. Oh, hang on, sorry. I mentioned something that sounded anti-capitalist. I think that's banned these days, isn't it? The government <laughs> not yet, I think that's next week. week. It's not precisely on this. <laughs> I'm so Rude sorry, the library. And you're Rude a non-departmental public body. I shouldn't have mentioned it. <laughs> them, but there are lots of cooperative <laughs> initiatives like that hmm. and better food traders people are very much about mutually sharing like the real bread campaign as well mutually sharing business models yeah to make it really work in a practical way i love them Fabulous. i think it's it's small scale it's it's small scale not in terms of actually how many people are involved or turnover but in terms of intricate networks yeah. are what really really work because they allow smaller producers to thrive and they actually support communities. I mean, again, as an architect, I would point to examples like, I mean, I only discovered this fairly recently, actually, in Tokyo, there was a, um, apparently a Land Use Act in 1952 that preserved farmland in the city. So as the city expanded, these organic family farms just stayed put and they still feed locals, local neighborhoods today, you know? And I mean, this is just such a beautiful thing, you know? So it absolutely can be done. Um, but as Kath said, you know, we need different economic models and different ideas of what a good life is. And land values are critical here. You know, you have to, I mean, planning is a socialist idea, you know, because if you just let money decide what gets built where, then you're just gonna get skyscrapers, you know? and. Again, that's something very interesting about COVID, of course, is what, what's going to happen if nobody can get any high rents in the middle of a city anymore? I mean, that's a completely huge and fascinating question that I would love to answer, but I suspect we're not going to have time now. <laughs> right, we might. Let me just ask you this other, before we go on to COVID, I've got another question, which I think rolls on from that first one, which is, um, and a couple of people have asked this in various ways, but... Uh, someone says, Carolyn, you recently did the most brilliant food programme with Sheila Dillon, where you imagined, they imagined that you were Prime Minister 
I have to say, everyone should go and listen to that. It was such fun. It was wonderful. <laughs> so you were prime minister and you were in charge of rethinking the world, the country along sustainable food lines. If you, Carolyn and Kath, were, were made PM tomorrow, what is the first thing that you would do to improve the food system? One wow. thing to ask for quick answers, please, ladies. Wow. I'm just going to take a moment to enjoy yeah, that. Well, I know what mine is, so I'll just say it, which is introduce the right to food in UK legislation so that we would become this society that doesn't let people go hungry. Yeah, I, I, I would say something very similar. I, I would say, yes, the right to eat well, um, because everything flows from that. I mean, I talk a lot in my book, and, and thank you for the question, by the way, that, that program was, I have to say, incredibly good fun to make. Um, just spending three hours imagining that, you know, kind of, there were actually hops growing around the Houses of Parliament. Anyway, um, but... Uh, Basically, my main proposal is that we revalue food, which means that we put the true value of food back in food. This means that food becomes expensive again. If you have a similar, if you also have a policy that says everyone deserves to eat well, then you need a more equal society. You need wealth redistribution. You know, everything flows from it. It is a revolutionary idea. Um, but yes, that, so I would have a similar policy. It would be the, the human right to eat well. Well, I'm your deputy employment. prime minister anyway, Carolyn, because I need to still sit at your feet. So, <laughs> could we could we yeah. kind of do it together? I quite like that idea. Well, I could sit on the. It's like a wall pack, isn't there, in the House of Lords? Perhaps we could borrow that as my little seat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it could be arranged. Okay, listen. Here's a lovely question from Annie Gray. So, hello, Annie. Uh, she says, "This is fab. Two questions in one." not least because I think others may have asked one. It's a pot boiler. It's quite clear that the government, especially the current one, has only the most tenuous grasp on current British foodways and the way they are linked to global issues. But it's also clear that this is an excellent, and sorry, it's also clear from this excellent discussion that, the, that, that a change needs to come from both official policy and individual pressure and action. So, quick fire, what three things would you have the government legislate on? It's quite similar. What three things as individuals? Let's focus on what can individuals do to get a balanced cy cytopia? Yeah. Uh, let's focus well, I mean, individuals with money can obviously do quite a lot at the moment. Individuals without money are a bit stuffed. So, um, I, I mean, actually, quite interestingly, um, I seem to have made two radio appearances recently, which is a very, very high hit rate for me. But... Um, you know, on the Today programme a few days ago, you know, and, and basically Sarah Smith was sort of saying to me, well, you know, no government could possibly give you, give you people the time to cook a decent meal. And I thought to myself, but only a government can give people the time to cook a decent meal because only a government can say, we are going to organise the economy so that people basically earn enough, you know, in 30 hours, 35 hours or whatever it is, that the rest of the time they can do what they like. And, and it's just this idea that somehow the market has to sort everything out and, and governments can't do anything. I mean, I would say, um, again, it's, 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 it's mostly to do with economics it, and, and it's mostly to do with land reform and planning. And uh, I, would, I would, I mean, I would look very, very hard but who owns what land and I would I would start putting actually a bit of Henry George's land value tax into action and it's very very delicate stuff this because you're literally saying to very very rich people we want some of your pony park please but I, I think it's kind of essential I think and it can be done sensitively and as I said before it can be done around a vision of a good life that could be sold as something that people would actually want to buy into. Kath, do you want to add anything? Or oh, I, can I be your deputy prime minister? Would that be all right, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's hard because at the moment there is so much law to be fought for. There is a huge amount going through Parliament at the moment, which will fundamentally affect our food and farming system, which is the agriculture bill, the fisheries bill, the trade bill and trade policy, which is actually being largely decided in private. So we aren't going to get a say on that anyway. So a bit of me, my heart sinks a bit at the idea of a, an ideal situation because I'm right in the middle of the fight at the moment about whether or not, you know, that any minute now the MPs will vote on whether or not it says in the agriculture bill that we should maintain British standards of food and farming production by law. 
and yeah. that's our antibiotics, our pesticide use, it's about our food standards, our labelling, it's about the farming, it's about the farmers' livelihoods, it's about fair tr uh, dealing. It's There's so much at stake at the moment that I, I almost can't think about the visionariness of how we would like it to be because we're right down in the engine room trying to make sure that the right things are happening and that we're steering in the right direction because the, and and I do see that some of the ripping up the standards in trade deal stuff which is imminent is something we have to fight back against it's all very well wanting to build Zootopia but one must also prevent the wrong kinds of decisions being made as well I'm not against trade but I am against standards being ripped up yeah pro antibiotics working forever uh, and actually at the moment we're thinking of making of incentivizing dirty production in other countries and you know doing deals that favor it so uh i don't mean to be negative because as you probably gathered i am very bought into the idea of working towards utopia but there is some hard work to be done also on the defensive yeah no i mean it's it, everything you say is critical and and utopia can't exist without main, everything that you've mentioned maintaining standards because it's it's fundamental to a good life there is no good life with bad food and so it's all about it, putting those values right at the heart of everything. Where, yeah, it, values it, are at the heart of it, yeah. The kinds of values and the kinds of people we'd like to be. You know, the good talking about the good life in an Aristotelian way uh, is not something I do in my everyday work, but how do we actually apply some philosophy yeah. to this of how we would like to live our lives? Yeah. How will we, you know, in, in a wonderful moment when the UK could be taking back control is a phrase we've heard from yeah the, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, well what, what does control look like does control look like you know then bending to the next trump deal and saying yes let's have chlorine chicken and hormone beef and you know twinkies or is it that we say actually we've got some values to this and we want to be supporting a race to the top we want to be supporting agroecological farming because um, funnily enough our entire future depends on it i mean you're arguing for that in your way i'm arguing for that in my way and you know as i said at the beginning what amazes me is that we're doing precisely the same thing. We're just doing it in very different ways. You know, you're a campaigner, you're brilliant at policy. I'm, I'm a, an architect and a thinker. And, you know, I like, I like to conjure up the vision of what it could be like, because I think if you do that, then you can, it's easier to get people to buy into it. So it's, it's all essential. It's all got to be done. We're just working like a pair of velociraptors coming from different angles at the same time at the yeah, same goal. Of course, it's also deeply human at the same time, because I can hear in the other room my, my six-year-old refusing to eat her vegetables. So <laughs> the sort of, you know, it's also the, the sort of ordinariness of all of this as well. <laughs> Let's remind ourselves, we're not talking about high-level stuff, we're talking about the stuff of life. Yeah. Everydayness, you know. Yeah. yeah. But I think giving ourselves permission to ask the big questions, that is the great beauty and power of food. It gives you permission to ask the really big questions. In fact, it makes it imperative. And, you know, I would never have had the courage to be talking about this stuff were it not for the fact of having food, having been my guide. So that's Why what I would think, I? So. I'm on that, Carolyn. Mm. Yeah. I am, I'm so tempted to ask, there's so many other great questions. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm going to ask one more question, even though there are like 10 more questions here that we could ask. I'm going to ask one more because we are. I want to meet everybody on this call. Can we should do I can do. I go to the pub or something, for God's exactly. sake. Exactly. Rule of, rule of 30. <laughs> the old days, we'd all go out to the pub now, but I'm afraid we can't. So I'm, I'm just picking, really, there are so many great questions here, but this one. Um, uh, here we are, this is from Angela. When lockdown first hit, there were people shopping more from small producers. And at the time they said they'd never go back relying on to relying on supermarkets so much and would keep on supporting small cheese, meat, veg suppliers. But that doesn't seem to have quite happened. And now we hear small producers are losing customers back to the supermarkets. What could have been done, should have been done, and what could we do to stop that drift? I have yeah. been shouting about this throughout COVID. I'm not going to shout at you lovely people because you tuned into a, a good food talk. Uh, my Zoom screen throughout COVID was full of policymakers who were moving enormous amounts of public money into the supermarkets through things like multi-million pound free school meal vouchers, like Healthy Start vouchers. You know, a lot of the money that you and I pay in our taxes gets used badly to not support the kinds of farming and food production that we'd like to see. And it's called technically public procurement, but actually millions and millions of your and my pounds should be being spent better. So 
absolutely there are things that we could have done right from the start that would have been better. Why did we leave it up to individual choices about whether the farmers were doing all right or not? Why were we not buying up very large amounts of catering supply chain food and making it sure it ended up uh, with people having been paid for properly and ended up with people who needed it the most rather than expecting poor people to receive the scraps from the supply chain um, fed out through poor food banks who were working their guts off to try and... Uh, I'm sorry, you're getting me on a really cross hobby horse here. But I, it was really tough going for the food banks during COVID and that's absolutely mm -hmm. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it was partly because vulnerability to COVID was only defined at first as a medical need, mm -hmm. not as a socioeconomic need, mm -hmm. as in some people who didn't have enough money therefore couldn't have food. And it took us probably eight weeks mm -hmm. from people like the Trussell Trust, the Independent Food Aid Network, wonderful people, literally in tears sometimes saying vulnerability is also about whether or not people can afford good food. Yeah. So this is about the welfare system. It's about housing costs. It's about, you know, addressing this in a more civilized way throughout society. Oh, I could go on. I'll stop because it's not fair, but it, it really, honestly, there are so many things we could have done better. But Kath, actually, I think this is a perfect place to stop, not because I want to, but because I think it really draws attention to the work that you do at Sustain, what your books have done, Carolyn, which is to point out that this is structural. It is not down to individual choices. It's to do with structural problems, yeah. which can be solved through structural solutions and that there are solutions out there that it's not an accident that we end up back at the supermarket, that, that the food banks don't have enough money, that people go hungry. This isn't an accident. It can be changed. It can be challenged. And that is the work that you're doing. And so everyone who's watching um, tonight, I implore you, go and have a look at the sustain website it is quite amazing it's inspiring there are incredible projects there um i mean if you do not have carolyn's books do yourselves a favor and get them because they are wonderful finally i'm just going to read out one point from carolyn carol mcquire which she says please could you both do a book with george monbio on land in the uk and then please go into politics so i think <laughs> that's an excellent idea um, I would like to thank you both for the most riveting discussion. It could have gone on much longer. I wish we were going to the pub. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, also, thank you to KitchenAid for uh, sponsoring this. If any of you who have been listening would like to support the work of the British Library, uh, please look at the sponsorship bot button on your website. I just want to draw your attention to two um, food season events that are coming up this Saturday, both of which are wonderful. One is in the uh, middle of the afternoon with Jack Munro and Kimberly Wilson in conversation with uh, Zoe. Um, she's one of my friends. I've just completely forgotten her name. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Oh, it's coming back to me in a second. She is one of my great friends. Anyway, Jack Monroe and Kimberly Wilson um, talking about food and um, mental health, which have been very interesting, particularly in light of COVID and how the strains that put on individual people and families. And then later in the afternoon, um, coming from River Cottage, Melissa Helmsley and Ralph Anderson, a uh, cookery demonstration, which is absolutely delicious and wonderful uh, about how to have more taste and less waste, which is wonderful. I've already seen it. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to leave you with the thought that there isn't a single thing that you can't address through food. The words of Carolyn Steele and the words of Kath Dalmany ringing in my ears. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful evening. Thank you so much.